This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hey, this is Tisha Manteep with the Neurology Podcast. I'm here today with Michelle Ferrari to discuss mechanisms of migraine, lessons from the first gene to novel targets. Michelle Ferrari is a professor emeritus in neurology and chair of the Leiden Center for Translational Neuroscience at Leiden University Medical Center. Welcome, Michelle. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. In 1996, you made a major discovery in identifying the first gene for migraine. Can you tell us what that was like and just give us a brief summary of the hemiplegic migraine genes? Where are we today in terms of that knowledge? Yeah, to summarize a little bit, because it's a rare, very severe and uh, autosomal dominant monogenic subtype of migraine in which uh, patients have hemiparesis during an otherwise very typical migraine attack. These hemiparesis may last several hours or in rare cases, even days to weeks, mimicking a stroke. Uh, and during the attacks, the uh, the other symptoms, the prodromes, the headache, the associated symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, and photophobia, and the other aura symptoms are exactly the same as in the text of common forms of migraine. As you mentioned, we discovered in 96, it can be caused in about 50% of the families by mutations in the kecna one a gene, which uh, codes for a PQ-type neuronal calcium channels and regulates the neuronal uh, release of neuroexcitatory neurotransmitters such as glutamate. We also found that other mutations in the very same gene can cause episodic ataxia type 2 or spinocerebellar ataxia type 6. And this may uh, explain why some patients may also have ataxia. Later on, we learned that in other families, may be caused by at least two other genes, so three in total, and there is debate about a fourth possible gene. The mutations in the three genes each have a different pathophysiological effect, but the overall consequence is the same, and that is a local increase in brain glutamate and thus an increased neuronal excitability and enhanced susceptibility to spreading depression. As I already mentioned, mutations in KECNA1A causes increased neuronal release of glutamate. But the mutations in the, for instance, the FHM2 gene, the ATP1A2, that is a a sodium-potassium ATPase gene, causes a reduced neuronal reuptake of glutamate in the synaptic cleft and mutations in the FHM3 gene, that is the uh, SCN1A gene, the sodium potassium channel alpha subunit gene causes reduced inhibition of neuronal excitability. So three different mechanisms, but the final common pathway seems to be all increased neuronal excitability and enhanced susceptibility to spreading depolarization. And of course, the multi-billion dollar question is whether this specific mechanism is also involved in the common types of migraine with, but also in migraine without aura. I think these genes, fascinating. (laughs) Your lab was able to discover all of this. How does that compare to where we are today? I know you're involved in a lot of these GWAS studies. So uh, in common migraine, I think it's uh, important to give a bit of introduction to mechanisms of diseases because in principle, most diseases are multifactorial. They result from the interaction between a specific genetic predisposition and interaction with specific endogenous and exogenous non-genetic environmental factors. So some rare diseases such as FHM are monogenic, i.e. caused mainly by a major defect in a single gene, and the non-genetic environmental factors 
contribute very little to the disease risk. However, most diseases are due to an um, interaction of both non-genetic and genetic factors. Now, migraine is uh, such an example. It's, it, it truly is a, a polygenetic disorder where uh, multiple, often hundreds of genes, play a role in about 50% of the contribution. So the identification of individual risk genes in such a disease is very difficult and requires what we call genome-wide association studies, GWAS, as you mentioned. And the difficulty with GWAS is actually that one can only identify loci, not the genes itself. The functional translation of a locus to a specific gene and the pathogenetic mechanism is still ex- extremely difficult. To do a good uh, GWAS, one often needs several hundred thousand patients and match controls from the same cultural uh, region. So for, for, for migraine, more than 100 disease loci have now been identified and each have only very little, very small contribution to disease risk. Some specific genes could be identified, but mostly uh, not yet. Uh, Some of the genes identified have a therapeutic link. For instance, a CGRP gene was amongst the identified loci, and others are related to vascular and neuronal mechanisms and possible complications of migraine. So we are going very nicely, but we are still not yet there. I think that is very fascinating. And really just to try and bring that back to the patient, we have so many patients that come in, they want to know the cause of their migraine. And, you know, it's important to be able to explain that it's a polygenetic disorder. There are, yes, environmental factors, but that, you know, we don't yet have a blood test to be able to, you know, design or tailor treatment or even guide prognosis. That would be the ultimate, or at least a very important goal, is to 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 come up with an objective test for what migraine is, and we don't have that yet. And I was reading one of your papers back from 2013, and this was discussing the migraine brain and the vulnerability to migraine attacks. You describe it as excitability leading up to a tipping point for spreading depression and reduce brain resilience. I thought that was very eloquently stated and very useful when patients are thinking about trigger management. Can you describe that a little bit more, that process or the biology of that? Well, let's start with spreading depolarization. There is indeed a major discussion whether or not spreading uh, depolarization is involved in migraine with aura, but also even more uh, involved in migraine without aura. Personally, I'm in the yes camp. That's based on an array of clinical and therapeutical and experimental animal data. But there is certainly as yet no definite evidence for that spreading depolarization is involved or is not involved. So it's an ongoing debate. To me, I would say this is one of the major questions in migraine research. For instance, in animal models, in uh, transgenic mice, female sex hormones appear to increase the susceptibility to develop spreading depression. That is, that they developed spreading depolarization at a lower trigger. And interestingly, male sex hormones did the opposite. So they seem to protect a little bit. If you introduce an FHM gene mutation into female transgenic mice, they were more likely to develop spreading depolarization at a much lower trigger than their male counterparts. This brings us, of course, to why and how do spreading depolarization start? Well, the honest answer is we don't know. But what we think, and that is what we uh, outlined in the uh, 2013 uh, publication, that it may be uh, the tipping point analogy. And that is that you go to a point of no return, that there, there is an increase in attack, so to say, and then suddenly you tip over points. We don't know whether this is true. Uh, we do have some evidence that it may be true. We Actually, yesterday there was a, a paper uh, a- accepted where we showed uh, that in patients, right before the attack, 
they, there is a build-up and then uh, suddenly uh, a release with spreading depolarization. And let's hope that this turns out to be true. And I've read papers about brain atrophy and hemiplegic migraine and small volumetric changes in migraine. Any relevance there? That were rare cases and they do not seem to translate to the big majority of migraine patients. I read in one of your papers that you wrote about in targeting migraine to not just look at therapies that target the migraine mechanism specifically, but also that may have dual roles in targeting also the comorbidity. Yes, it's very important to identify the causes of comorbidity. And, and again, genetic research may help us because there is some evidence that the fact that uh, migraines have a higher risk of depression, for instance, psychological depression, may be explained by an overlap of uh, genetic predisposition. And some, mainly female migraines, have a higher risk of stroke. And uh, that may also be explained by some genetic overlap. In the GWAS studies, uh, some of the loci seem to be associated with genes with a vascular function. So there, there is a lot to do to really find out what are the causes of complications, uh, mainly uh, depression and stroke. And then, of course, to uh, try to, to manage that risk. So thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate you being here. Um, this was very enlightening. We, we spoke a lot about the genetics, cortical spreading depression, migraine mechanisms, and the future targets for migraine all in one podcast. So thank you. Thank you for having me. And I hope this will uh, promote even more research into the, the fascinating genetic uh, basis of migraine. This is Tisha Manteith. Thank you for listening to the Neurology Podcast. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes. Or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about. The views and opinions of the participants in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the journal Neurology or the AAN. Disclosures of the participants are included in the show descriptions reached by a link on the neurology.org website.